Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, especially to our guests today, um, our primary guest today, that is Chuane University of Technology, to the SSA series Exploring the Ecology of Savannas and Grasslands. Now, the savanna biome supports many of Africa's most renowned species and consequently is often synonymous with scenes of Africa as depicted in these movies. Today, we have Dr. Bruce McKenzie for an exploration of the ecology of this iconic and important biome using South Southern African case studies. Now, Dr. Bruce McKenzie has a PhD in biology from U the University of Cape Town. During his lifetime, he has been a lecturer at various universities and has sat on several prominent com committees, including SANBI, the South African Institute of Biodiversity, Cape Nature, and the South African chapter of the IUCN. He was the Minister for the Forestry Advisory Committee and was the first Executive Director of the Botanical Society of Southern Africa. He is passionate about promoting conservation education and has supervised many successful MSc and PhD candidates at disadvantaged universities. In addition to this, he has published over 40 scientific publications and has recently authored the book, An Ecological Guide to the Bush. Dr. McKenzie describes himself as, and his ecological interests and contributions as a jack of all traits in an ecology and a master of none with a focus on building confidence in and creating opportunities for the youth. Now, we would also like to thank Dr. Bruce for donating a number of books to TUT. And I have some fantastic news for everyone. Today, three lucky students will win a book. So listen carefully. And with that, I hand over to you, Dr. Bruce. Okay, thank you very much for um, the introduction and all those nice words. Greetings to all the students uh, from the Fainbos biome here in Cape Town. Long way away at the moment from uh, the Savannah biome. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to uh, introduce you to the Southern African Savannah biome uh, with some of my ideas of what we need to consider, um, uh, especially for those of you who are going to have a career in conservation. So this is an introduction to the South African savanna biome. Uh, it's not a, a detailed examination of savanna biome, but what I'm hoping is that um, it will give you an opportunity to think uh, just beyond the normal classification side of biomes. So we need to start by um, um, saying, uh, what is actually a biome and um, biomes are the largest ecological formations recognized and located on a continental scale and climate is the determining factor. I've emphasized the scale there because biomes are really um, concentrated on, on a world scale and um, extremely large um, and driven mainly by climate as a determining factor. And they are characterized mainly by plant structure, which is in a more technical term, the physiognomy, and their seasonal patterns, which is the phenology, and they are recognizable from space. And I emphasize that from space, because if you take a photograph from space, you can identify the 10 terrestrial biomes on the Earth's surface. Plant structure is extremely important, and it's the plant structure that's found in the various latitudinal zones, in fact, is representative of the maximum amount of sunlight energy, which is captured by plants in that particular biome. Now, I emphasize this because quite often um, when people describe biomes, they just talk about the structure without actually giving any emphasis to the energy. And the book that I um, have just authored concentrates on the energy. And of course, the energy um, that flows through an ecosystem 
starts with that which is captured by plants. So the plant formations that are found um, on a continental scale are important is, as the starting point of energy, and they pro provide the starting point for much detail, more detailed study and understanding of the ecology of much smaller scaled areas, which are essentially the management units. And most of you students are going to be ending up at, um, at some stage or other managing a reserve or maybe being a guide in a reserve, but you'll be operating really in smaller management units within the overall large scale biome. So that's what biomes are. And we are going to concentrate today on the savanna biome. And the savanna biome um, is uh, um, one of 10 biomes found on the Earth's surface, uh, terrestrial biomes. And it is particularly well represented on the southern continents, um, South America, Australia, and of course, Africa. And it covers 50% of the African surface. And as you will see just now, when I put up a map, uh, it's roughly a mirror image between um, its presence uh, in the northern part of Africa, above the equatorial zone and the area south of the equator. Now, this is important. It covers most of the land area between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. And this is a distance of some 5,500 kilometers. Just think of that for a moment. We're talking about the savanna, which can be identified from space. And we get a plant formation uh, forming in that area. And here in Africa, from north to south, from the Two, between the two tropics, it covers a distance of 5,500 kilometers. And in its widest point in central North Africa, Savannah covers some 16,000 kilometers from east to west. Wow. You know, when you just think about the size of this area and trying to classify it and trying to understand the Savannah in terms of managing it, it covers vast areas. So one would thus expect a considerable um, uh, variation in climatic and geological and physical conditions across such a large area. So it's not as simple um, as we make out. Let's just look where the major biomes, um, uh, savanna biomes occur in Africa. So your equator runs roughly through there. That blue is the equatorial rainforests, and then to the north and to the south of that equatorial rainforest, we get the savanna. And the savanna here is actually divided into three a mosaic um, between the equatorial forest and true savanna, going into moist savanna, and then into dry savanna, which I'll come to a bit later. And you've got a mirror, mirror image on the southern hemisphere of Africa. What is interesting, in the Horn of Africa, we find a drier savanna, um, so your equatorial rainforest does not stretch all the way through. And this is largely because of the Rift Valley, which runs from north to south through this area. And we get a lot more drier conditions than we do in this area here. So th this is um, typical of what you find the mirror image. So north of the savanna, we get the desert, um, the Sahara Desert up north, and then down south, um, the Kalahari Desert in South Africa. And where I am here is the Fainbos or the Mediterranean biome, and that is found right north in Africa as well. So essentially you've got a mirror image, and different latitudinal areas north and south of the equator. Um, what we need to do now is let's look a little bit more at the formation of the um, actual vegetation. So let's look at the characteristics of African savannas. Um, 
firstly, what is important, remember, I referred in the first slide to climate. So it's the quantity and seasonality of rainfall across the areas I described above that is the most important environmental factor. And for savannas, rainfall is between about 250 millimeters and 1,200 millimeters per annum. And it mainly falls in the summer season. Okay, so that is the climatic um, starting point for describing summers. Two important issues there, the amount of rainfall and the fact that it mainly falls in the summer season. And remember, that biomes were classified largely on the structure of vegetation. So those climatic conditions typically uh, forms plant formations that do not allow total dominance of trees, that is the forest, and is best represented by an equal um, amount of grass and trees. So in the picture here, we've got a typical uh, savanna, moist savanna um, type, trees and grass and uh, none of them dominate roughly an equal amount of biomass in the tree component and in the grass component so that is um really what you'll see and of course this the, the canopy is not close so these trees are separated at least a canopy apart um, so it's rather like an open woodland uh, dominated by trees and grass. However, what is extremely important, as I have shown you that the, the vast area identified as savanna in Africa, covering 5,000 kilometers from north to south, and then 16,000 kilometers in its widest portion in North Africa, one would expect a considerable difference in the range of plant formations that are found, because you're going to get slightly different climatic conditions. So the areas that are really dry will have less trees and grass, whereas the more moister areas will tend to have more trees um, present. So I want to just take you through a few um, uh, pictures that I've taken in, in my uh, um, movement through Africa. Um, so here we've got a typical moist savanna plant structure in Madagascar. Um, don't see too much grass in this picture. However, uh, um, there are plenty of trees quite close together. Um, in, in the in the space between each other. Very importantly, we're looking at quite a few trees here that are deciduous, they rust their leaves already, and I'll come to that later. And um, the canopy of the trees is not closed. Therefore, it's not forest, it is savanna. And um, if we move off from uh, this one, to my next slide. That last uh, picture was a, um, a typical um, moist savanna, really in the wet side of savanna, lots of trees, canopies not touching, um, but uh, definitely not forest. Uh, here we've got a typical uh, grassy savanna in the Serengeti of East Africa, uh, where we um, see uh, the big game populations. Note there are fewer trees in the environment, lots of grass, mainly due to the volcanic soils, which are nutrient rich in the area, and um, which is also in that area which I showed you at the Horn of Africa, um, uh, uh, just north and south of the equator. Um, now let's look at some more drier savanna types. So here's a rocky savanna in Namibia on the left. Uh, note uh, the trees are much smaller in size, little grass, mainly because um, the grass plants roots are too shallow to uh, obtain water from uh, uh, lower areas in the soil profile. So trees are more prominent and the same on the very dry savanna on the right 
we see um, uh, scattered trees, uh, very little grass again. Um, in, this is in a, actually in the good season and the trees are still in evergreen state. And then just a, a, a final one on differences, uh, pictures of savannah. Here, yeah, savannah on the edge of the desert, um, again, dominated by uh, trees and uh, very little grass. Okay, so um, when you've got a, um, a, a situation like that, they are all part of the savanna biome. But as you've seen from those pictures, there's a variety of plant formations that are found. So in Africa, what has happened because of the large scale and extent of the savanna biome in Africa, it has found, been found useful to divide this one biome into two types. And what this has enabled uh, um, scientists to do is to introduce more functional and taxonomic factors to assist in the ecological understanding. Remember when we talk just about savanna generally, um, what we were saying is that is rainfall was an important climatic or functional um, and driving force. And we didn't talk about any taxonomic factors. We just talked about the structure of plants. So as you divide the African savanna up into two types, the moist and dry, um, it has enabled us to get more, a better understanding of the ecological relationships. So what we're going to um, look at is some of the general characteristics um, in the uh, moist and dry savannas in um, Africa. So let's start with moist savanna, occupies about 21% of Africa and found in the central areas adjacent to that equatorial forests. And in the dry savannas, occupies about 26% of Africa, mainly north and south of the moist savanna blocks. Now, we're able to divide those, the two savannas into uh, uh, smaller areas in terms of the height above sea level. So moist savanna generally occurs on cooler areas between 1,000 and 1,200 meters above sea level, while dry savanna is found in the hot valleys and lowlands between sea level or not uh, meters above sea level and a thousand meters above sea level. And that is one of the reasons why you get that dry savanna in um, East Africa, because of the hot rift valley that um, um, passes through that region. The annual rainfall in the um, uh, moist types is between uh, 650 and uh, um, 1200 millimeters per annum with less than eight months um, dry period. So we're introducing more um, um, more functional characters in terms of climate. And here again, I'm afraid, oh, there we go. Annual rainfall in the dry savanna is much less between 250 and 650 millimeters per annum with more than eight months of a dry period. So now we've got been able in Africa more or less to divide the savanna biome into two savannas, one dry, one moist, and basically of equal size, um, but, uh, each of them covering about 20 to 25% of the African continent with the um, moisture ones on the cooler, higher slope uh, um, altitude, uh, with more rainfall, less dry months, and the opposite for dry savanna. And what's important to hear is because of the higher rainfall in the moist savanna, we get leaching of nutrients from the soil. Leaching is, is the drainage of nutrients down the soil profile, so away from the roots. So, um, because of the high amount of leaching from the higher rainfall, 
the soils, the nutrients in the soils tend to be relatively poor, while in the more dry savanna, the nutrients in the soil are low, so soils are comparatively rich. Just another uh, map of Africa again, just to show you the two differences. So here, um, below the equator in Southern Africa, this is the moist savanna in this light gray, uh, and a slightly darker gray, and um, the drier savanna um, in the light gray. Okay, and again, north of the equator, the moist savanna there, and then the dry savanna stretching all across that 16,000 kilometer band I talked about earlier from west to east Africa and down the Rift Valley. Also note that um, as you start to um, look at a more local scale, the moist savanna in southern Africa also passes down the east coast here um, to the, on the coastal sides of the mountains. Right, so let's look at some of the vegetation characteristics of um, the moist and dry savanna. So what we typically find here is um, the uh, moist savannas have trees that are usually greater than 12 meters in height. Um, the leaves tend to be broad and they may be deciduous or semi-deciduous. Um, what this means is, is that uh, when you talk about deciduous, they lose their leaves annually, and semi-deciduous is when they will partly lose their leaves. Um, a much smaller portion of trees in savannah are evergreen, which means that they retain their leaves for a whole season or a whole year, and only lose their leaves in terms of old age. And then, very importantly, uh, um, thorns are, are not important, but chemical defense is high. And um, the biomass production is also high, simply because we got high rainfall, remember, but it's less palatable to herbivores, partly because the nutrients um, are, are low, and what we did, call this type of felt is sour felt, um, which is palatable in the rainy season, but tends to be less palatable in the dry season. And then a very important aspect, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail, is fire. Fire is very frequent, uh, one to five years, mainly because you've got a higher bi high biomass, it's sour felt, so a lot of the felt is not um, grazed, a lot of the grasses are not grazed, which means uh, it, after the rainy season are not grazed, therefore they dry out and um, subject to fire. On the other hand, the dry savanna, trees generally less than six meters high, so half the size in height than the previous one. The leaves tend to be small leaves, typical of the acacias, um, which of course have changed their name to Senegalia and Vachelia now, but I still like to call them acacias, and they're usually deciduous. And spines or thorns are common as a defense mechanism, whereas chemical defense is rather low. And of course, because of lower rainfall, your biomass production is lower, but they are palatable to herbivores, called sweet felt, and that's mainly because the Grasses, for example, remain palatable throughout the um, year. So even in the um, uh, uh, winter months, uh, there's still sufficient protein in the grass, grasses, which um, allows them to be palatable to be herbivores. And the fire frequency obviously is much less between five and 50 years, basically because there is less biomass and less biomass left over after the rainy season. Now let's look at um, vegetation uh, characters a little bit more detailed. I mentioned that uh, they tend to be in, in the moist forests, or moist savanna, sorry. Um, the um, leaves tend to be broad-leafed, more than two centimeters wide. 
and the branches are usually thornless, as indicated in, in the diagram there, and typical of your moist savanna shown in the photograph, where there's basically an equal proportion of grass and trees and um, typic, typical species that um, uh, are, are more broadleaf are the bush willows. Um, whereas in the, fire, in the drier type, they tend to be fine leafed, thorny branches on the trees, and they are these are common in dry savannas. And this is typical of your acacias, um, where uh, um, you know, I've got compound leaves, deciduous, very small leaves, and in drier areas, as you can see from the photograph, less grass, and the trees all are mainly there are acacias and other drier types. Now, some of you might ask, well, what is the advantage of being having small leaves in a drier environment? Well, one of the reasons is um, if you've got a very small surface area in your leaf, you um, firstly would expect to be absorbing less of the very uh, solar radiation, in other words, high temperatures. However, this is a little bit misleading because uh, the surface area of a very small leaf um, is is relatively large to its volume. So if it's going to um, photosynthesize, um, it's got a small space. A small leaf has got a small space to store water. And um, so it's, one would think, well, maybe this is not a good idea to have small leaves um, in a, uh, um, a arid or dry environment. But one of the main reasons why you get it is that um, it's related to what we call the boundary layer, where larger leaves tend to get hotter than small leaves because of the larger surface area. And that boundary layer um, is much hotter than the air above it, and therefore um, often pre prevents uh, physiological um, processes happening in the plant itself. Whereas the smaller leaf on the right, um, it tends to have a much, much, much smaller boundary layer, less hot, and in fact uh, has the advantage that any small wind or draft or convection actually disturbs that boundary layer and actually cools the leaf. So what you're actually having is a cooling effect in this very hot and arid environments by having small leaves and therefore it's an advantage over a, a big leaf. Now, that's fine. We've got uh, moist and dry savannas. We can characterize them quite easily. But what we want to do is to divide uh, these um, savannas, two savannas into smaller units. Now, most African co countries contain savanna. And many have further divided the moist and dry, dry savannas to a finer scale. Now, of course, each country is responsible itself for managing its natural systems. And um, they're all different um, approaches to actually um, managing uh, savanna in the different countries of Africa. And um, Many of them, or most of them, have um, divided the moist and savannas into a finer scale, which allows them to, to manage a bit better. So in Southern Africa, well, here I'm just referring to South Africa, Swaziland, and Lesotho, the moist and arid savannas have been divided into six bioregion and a total of 87 vegetation what are called vegetation units. So what we are doing is we, we're taking this um, biome, which remember is on a very large scale, the savanna, um, very difficult to try and manage anything at that level. We've divided it into two, the moist and dry savannas, and then scientists have further in Southern Africa divided the moist and uh, arid savannas into six bioregions, and a total of 87 vegetation units. 
note, we're still talking about vegetation. And remember, right at the beginning, I, I mentioned that uh, biome, uh, it's the plant formation which determines the biome. So we, we're still talking about vegetation here. So at each division, you can collect more detailed environmental information, for example, climate and soil type, and more plant taxonom taxonomic information, thus adding to our eco ecological understanding of a smaller scale area. Okay, so we've really seen this when we uh, divided um, the savanna into moist and dry. We saw the differences in rainfall, and we also saw the differences in uh, the leaching effect from that rainfall, which um, enabled us to distinguish the two uh, types. And we were able to further um, uh, look at some taxonomic effect by looking at the size of the, the leaves. Right, if we're gonna uh, look at this in a bit more detail, um, we find that the moist savanna and dry savanna in South Africa can be divided into six different um, bioregions. Starting on the left, moist savanna um, can be divided into the sub escarpment. So that is on the east coast of South Africa, below the Drakensberg Mountains. That's what's called the sub escarpment. And the low felt, and low felt is typical of the Kruger National Park, which I'm sure you're all aware of. They tend to be largely moist savannas. And then uh, in, in the northern part of the Kruger and um, in, towards the central part of South Africa, we get Mapani and central bush felt um, bioregions. And then as we move further um, west, uh, we get the eastern Kalahari and then the Kalahari dune felt. So going in this diagram from left to right, we're going from more moist uh, areas to really dry areas in the Kalahari Strandfelt, and in the middle, um, a mosaic or a mixture of the two. And uh, let's just look at uh, the number of vegetation units in each of those. So your sub escarpment, which is a rather small area, of the moist savanna, we only find seven vegetation units and they have an average size of 5,000 square kilometers. Just think about that for a moment. 5,000 square kilometers, the average size of each of those units. That's a massive area. Again, difficult to manage. And as we go through, we see the low felt has got 24 different vegetation units a slightly smaller average size, 2,800 square kilometers. And as we go to in, into the mosaics, the Mapani and Central Bushveld, find they've got eight vegetation units and 28 vegetation units uh, respectively. And the average sizes are just over 3,000 square kilometers. And then right on the western side of the country, uh, we get the Eastern Kalahari, very large area, uh, 16 vegetation units, the average size of each one there being 8,000 square kilometers. And then finally, the Kalahari dune felt, also a very large area, only four vegetation units, but with an average size of 10,000 square kilometers. So what we've done here is divided um, through uh, scientific research, classifying the, the savanna into moist and dry and further into different bioregions and finally into different vegetation units, which um, uh, allow us to um, understand uh, the um, biome a bit better. So here we've got a map of, of essentially all the biomes in South Africa. What I'm interested in showing you here are the seven biomes. Um, the, uh, um, the, the savanna biome, and we are um, going from the Kalahari dune felt here, A, through to the Kalahari bush felt, B, and up into C, the central bush felt, Mapani up in the north, 
down the right hand side the low felt and then the sub escarpment um, on the right of the diagram here so that's what i'm interested in at the moment is um, the savannah of south africa divided into moist and dry and six bioregions and there are 87 different vegetation units within those bio, um, those bioregions. Don't worry about the other biomes at the moment. We're only interested really in the savanna. So now we've got to ask the question, are these vegetation units a fine enough scale for management? And I would argue no, simply because as we have seen, um, this, all, all those vegetation units that I showed you, all 87 have an average of more than 1,000 square kilometers, therefore not ideal as a management unit, a largely too, too large. And we find very few natural areas of vegetation units remaining today. Um, just for example, the one that we are mostly familiar with in Southern Africa, the largest low felt bioregion is best represented by the Kruger National Park Conservation Area. However, many smaller units of savannah in Southern Africa are in private ownership. And I think this is an important uh, concept to think about. There are over 5,000 game ranches and game, uh, private game reserves in South Africa. Each on, uh, each on average covering an area of about 1,000 hectares. Now we are getting towards a, a, a size where probably it's easier to understand the system and to be able to manage it. So these small areas are much more ideal for introducing the ecosystem concept, which caters for management. And what's important here is that an ecosystem is a defined system of living organisms and non-living organisms that need to interact with each other. Um, and you don't really get that when you're talking about a savanna biome at the largest scale. For example, simply um, the animals in the north part of Africa are not all the same as the ones in the southern savannas of Africa, therefore are not interacting. Um, and it's sometimes, as we've seen, quite difficult to define the system. Um, so we really need to look at the ecosystem concept and it's probably easier to do that at a smaller scale. So most of the smaller remaining patches of savanna, such as game ranches and smaller reserves have definite defined boundaries. For example, they have fences. I find that this is often um, uh, not considered um, in, in, in describing uh, reserves and the importance. It is extremely important to define your boundaries of your system. And uh, if you don't define your boundaries, it's difficult to understand your system, to study the system, and even more difficult to manage it. So therefore, a very important aspect of understanding ecosystems is that they should be con uh, only considered when we have definite defined boundaries. And it's easier to get an understanding of the ecological relationships. And that's the eco ecosystem concept in these smaller scale patches of savannas and allows for appropriate management. So I just want to end off with a, a, a key point to me, and which is what my book is focused on, is in a defined ecosystem, it is possible to estimate the energy present in the vegetation units. Remember the vegetation units are the plant formations. So we've got a small area below the uh, vegetation unit type. Um, with defined boundaries, and it's possible to estimate the energy present in the vegetation units, and then its subsequent flow through the ecosystem, through the um, 
primary and secondary consumers, and finally to the decomposers. So the quantity and energy contained in the plants can be estimated in terms of your grass and your browse, which is available within the system. Remember, browse is the um, herbage found in trees. So if we know the quantity of energy contained in plants and we know the requirements of certain animals, um, it's possible to be able to decide whether what sort of herbivores um, that, that um, reserve or game ranch can um, support. Now, just as an example here, I did show you uh, some really dry areas in Namibia, very little grass. So, for example, there's not much energy in the grass and um, the net result of this is you don't find um, many uh, grazes such as uh, buffalo, uh, hippopotamus, or white rhino, for example, in the eastern, uh, the, the, the western areas of um, the dry savanna, whereas you'll find all those animals in the more moister savanna, for example, in the Kruger. However, in the dry areas, also from the pictures I've shown you, there's plenty of browse available. So what we do find is animals, even in, in Namibia, in the uh, sub Namib, uh, below the escarpment in the river valleys where we get savanna, uh, there are trees um, with deep roots that provide browsing for animals such as elephant, uh, your desert elephant and your uh, giraffe and your black rhino, for example. So this is a, another example about that interacting um, interactions that are needed to understand the ecosystem, and it depends on the energy that's present in in the plants and grass and browse being the two important issues here. And it's climate that really drives how much energy is in each of those. So it then becomes possible to consider management options such as what herbivores and how many of each the ecosystem can support sustainability and of course the use of fire as a management tool. Um, obviously once you've done uh, put your herbivores in and you've got an idea of how many of each system, how many of each animal you can put in, um, you need to consider the next level or what predators you might have. So, but in the first instance, it is the herbivores that use the energy contained in the grass or the browse. And of course, uh, you get different herbivores. Uh, some, for example, are ruminants, uh, and others are ruminants or foregut fermenters, such as the giraffe, which is a browser and such as most of your antelope, uh, whereas the elephant and the zebra, for example, are hindgut fermenters. Um, so they have different ways of utilizing plant available energy. Right, so I just like to end off the concluding remarks by saying that uh, biomes are useful for comparing vegetation structure or the physiognomy on a global or world scale, but are less useful for management purposes at a local scale. So uh, that, I think that's an important lesson to, to learn. Certainly, um, we can learn a lot from, say, the Australian scientists who are working on savanna in Australia. Um, but for management purposes, we'll need to consider our own savannas uh, whether they are moist, dry, what bioregion do they, a particular area occur in, and can we um, operate at a small enough scale that allows us to manage appropriately. And that is the importance of the ecosystem concept, for it allows for management decisions to be considered within a smaller scale defined habitat. Again, I use that word defined habitat, which is uh, subset 
of a particular biome. And the smaller scale allows for detailed biological and non-biological information to be collected and leads to understanding the energy availability. Okay, again, an extremely important aspect, which I don't think is, is mentioned often enough, is the, the whole system and your defined system is driven about by the energy availability. And that energy that's available in the first place, your primary producers, your plants, or your plant formation of a biome is what is the starting point for driving that system. So your energy availability leads to an understanding of the interactions which allows for the sustainable management of the smaller biome unit. Thank you. Um, that is very informative. And I'm just thinking now, we as the SSA team were recently, were recently in the uh, Kruger National Park. And I actually mm -hmm. wish I watched this lecture before that because we went from the northern part south for five hours. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to open the floor to questions. If you can just raise your hands. In the meantime, we have one question mm -hmm. in the chat. Let me just go to it. So good afternoon, doctor. Is it not the frost that limits the spread of trees from the grassland biome rather than the rainfall itself from a climate perspective? And that is from Gustav Nicolero. Sorry, what was the, the uh, I missed the first part of that question. What was the? Is, is it, it not, not the, the frost that limits the spread the of frost. trees? Yeah. yeah. Look, all, all factors play an important part. I think what I was trying to do here is just indicate in, in a rather simple manner what is the um, overall first driving force. I mean, you can talk about frost or temperature or temperatures in the different seasons and so on. Um, but generally speaking, uh, savanna tends to have less frost generally, um, whereas grassland tends to have more. So um, I'd say uh, frost plays a role, but it's, I don't think it is, is necessarily the driving force. So it's like, a, yeah, many components. Yeah, all right. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dr. Bruce. Thank you for that. That was a, a really good presentation. In I'm actually in East Africa. We are sitting here in what I'd call a sub escarpment on the foothills of the Abadares. But of course, all of those yes. other biome, all of those other subsections don't quite fit into where we are. I'm also lucky enough to have worked in vegetation management in Australia, so I have a very good idea of, of how they work those subunits, which is something I wish the rest of the world did in many ways, because it, it made things very much easier. What I would like you to do, because I'm sure we have other people here from East Africa, and there are terms that you'd certainly use like sweet veld, sour veld, low veld. Would you kind of give us I know your your lecture was focused on Southern Africa, but can you give us an idea just where these things fall in East Africa in terms of terminology? Because, of course, we don't use that terminology at all. Um, yeah, I, I I could probably just put it this way is is um, you're really looking at palatability, for example, and, and, and just the fact that uh, how palatable um are your grasses and trees um uh, throughout the season so for example in really dry um so as far as i know having been to east africa i think uh, the same applies there is that um your, your grasses in your really drier savanna areas and vegetation units um will in, in fact retain uh, protein content for longer into the dry season than the more moist savannas. Okay, and that is why we call the uh, dry savannas here yeah, sweet because they're more palatable throughout the season, whereas um, the more moist savannas tend to be, we call them sour because they um, they produce those chemical defenses um, and lose palatability in the uh, more um, uh, winter months, in the driest seasons. 
Um, and then, you know, they say, on the other hand, uh, I think I talked about evergreenness and deciduousness. Um, evergreen trees, trees retain their leaves um, for longer, the green leaves for longer than grasses in both moist and arid savannas. And um, uh, so that is why um, quite a few herbivores that are uh, switched from gra grazing to browsing in the dry season because there's still green foliage available on the trees, whereas your grasses in many cases have lost their, their uh, nutrient status and are less palatable. Mm. Um, no, sure. I think that's a I, I'm not sure what, what it, I... <laughs> I'm not sure exactly if there are any other sort of the burning questions in relation to terminology that I used, but um uh, no, I think that's perfect, Dr. Bruce. And okay. there's just a couple of things I'd like to highlight, especially for students here, and you can come in as well where you want. CL has managed to get Dr. Dino Martins is going to also give a presentation in this series, and I hope. Um, Bruce that you can attend because I attended his grass talk that he did here in Kenya live and one thing that was fascinating and for everyone in this talk there's a lot of grass species that have actually become extinct in Kenya because of overgrazing because of mismanagement of those vegetation units and we actually have a program here and hopefully Dino will talk about it in reintroducing those species back into parts of Africa from America most of them have been preserved there in Texas and you know where the cows are going so that's that's one aspect that I I guess if you could come in on that and then Aisha before you mute me I do have one more thing to say yeah. so <laughs> Uh, yes, I think you're right. In, in this particular talk, I didn't want to go into too much into uh, the grasses. I mean, we in, in Southern Africa here, yeah, we talk about increase of grasses and decrease of grasses and increase of species well, um, and so on. Um, I'm not sure if, if that terminology is, is relevant to East Africa. But certainly we, we have lost uh, grasses as well. In this particular lecture, I didn't want to focus on either aliens, for example, or extinctions. I wanted to really just focus on, on the, call it the normal savanna before any major disturbance. Um, but Perfect. yeah, so Thank that, you. fascinating as a, as a management tool to reintroduce. But what is interesting about there, just in terms of that's, comes back to scale again. If you're going to reintroduce uh, grasses, you're going to have to start on a small scale, basically. Um, you can't just think of the, the uh, 10,000 square kilometer piece of savanna. You, you'd need to work at an ecosystem level. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, that, that's exciting stuff that you can, it's still available to uh, reintroduce grasses that have become extinct or lost. Mm. And we, we have a it. fantastic initiative here called Seed Balls <laughs> of Kenya. And mm -hmm. basically they're charcoal seed balls about yay big. And yes. anyone who, you can throw them out of your airplane windows. Okay. They have camels with the camel bags that are dropping the seeds as they move. Um, mm. But but just to, to finish on what I wanted to say was, that for everybody, all you students in this room, everyone who's attended this talk from Share Screen, I cannot tell you as an ecologist how valuable knowledge of um, biomes and, and grasslands and rangeland management is, because it is actually critical, even before you understand the animals. If you understand yeah. this, you will even know which animals are going to move in. You can look at that grassland and you can say, right, in in about three weeks, we're going to start getting these grazers through. And in a couple of weeks, these browsers. And you can manage that land so perfectly with no wildlife knowledge, but mm. all the vegetation knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So students, get studying. There's another question there. So um, as we know, is that trees need a large amount of nutrients. And due to the large amount of rainfall in the area, there's a lot of leaching which means um, lower, lower nutrients. So how come in dry areas, there's less trees and in moist areas, there's more trees? Well, from a, basically there's, there's sufficient nutrients. 
Um, they might be lower, doesn't necessarily mean it's totally nutrient poor, they're lower nutrients in, in the soil in, in, in moister areas. But what, what that is, is essentially saying is probably there are sufficient nutrients as long as you've got um, uh, sufficient rainfall, sufficient water to move those nutrients up into the um, into the canopies of the trees and allow photosynthesis to happen um, in the moister areas, even though the the soils might be uh, nutrient poor. Okay. On the other hand, even in the in the drier areas where you get less trees, it's but the nutrients are or levels are higher, um, what you probably are finding there is that the lower rainfall means that there's less water for uptake of nutrients, therefore fewer trees. Okay, that makes sense. I hope that makes sense to you, Asima. Then there's another question. This one is from yes. Pabalo Puhini. Good afternoon, doctor. What is your opinion on whether the game ranch industry contributes to biodiversity conservation in the savannah biome? Well, I'm not going to get into arguments about um, hunting or not hunting or that sort of thing. But what I am going to say is, yes, they are extremely important. I think, as I indicated in, in my talk, is there's some 5,000 properties, 5,000 private properties are in savannah. Okay, um, you, you know, I, I think if I remember correctly, the, the average size was about a thousand hectares. So you've got uh, five million hectares um, of savanna uh, biodiversity, which is in private hands. So it's extremely important in terms of biodiversity conservation. Um, might not agree with all the the, the different operations, but certainly um, their role is is extremely important. The government are not going to buy a whole lot of new reserves, that's for sure. Yes. No, I agree with you, Dr. McKenzie. Um, I'm just going to read a, a comment then from Gustav again. He says, uh, geology and soils have an important role on sweet felt and sour felt areas. But the main factor is weathering and leaching of nutrients due to rainfall events and levels. I think that is with a prior question regarding the frost. Um, but that's just a comment. It's not a question. A comment, yeah. 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 Uh, then we have from Tsipang Mudise. And Tsipang wants to know what are the biotic factors of the savanna biome? Well, the biotic factors are, are all the, the, the animals and plants um, that are found in the system. Okay. So when we, mm -hmm. we refer to biotic, it's, it's uh, the grasses, the insects, the antelope, the birds, whereas uh, the abiotic are the soils, uh, nutrients, um, geology, and so on. Uh, Tupang, that's going to be a long lecture if we have to list all of those. <laughs> yeah. um, Evaristo Andrew, why does wet savanna lack pines and thorns? How do they then deter herbivores? Where they lack thorns and is that is well, yeah, they, they uh, where, where they lack thorns and, and spines, for example. Uh, we we find that the moist savannas tend to have a gr greater concentration of chemical defenses such as tannins. Okay, and there is there is some evidence that when a uh, herbivore such as a kudu uh, browses on a, a tree, um, that that initiates an um, increase in tannin. Okay, and so and, and other chemicals as well which in fact um, then uh, encourages the animal to move off because it's becoming unpalatable. So increase in concentration of um, the tastes that the animal doesn't like. Yeah, is, is, I remember you said that sour felt is found in the moist savanna. 
Sauerfeld is, is it, a waste of NSA. Is, yeah. it, is it named Sauer for that reason? Because well, Sauerfeld is mainly there because it, 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 it really loses condition and uh, mm. um, um, becomes more unpalatable in the drier season. In, in, in trees, yes, in, in a way, but uh, uh, grasses just become dry and contain less protein. So they don't necessarily, don't, don't necessarily, some grasses have got a chemical um, uh, pre, um, deterrence to, to grazing, but it's, it's just a, a general thing of drying out. And, you know, uh, a, a, a brown grass leaf is not as palatable as a nice green grass grass. Yeah, leaf. yeah. Um. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question. This is from Pusi Krai. Oh, I lost it. Has there been any significant change or reduction in the size of the savanna biome since the first release of the 2006 Mussina and Ruth Report publication? I'm not sure if you're able to answer. Um... I, 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 I think I know what you're saying, but, but those are the authors which actually identified the vegetation units, which I referred to. Um, sure. Look, there, there, there has been a reduction in all uh, um, yeah. biome types and, and vegetation units, but I can't give you an honest answer about whether it's been significant or not. Um, there, there's pressure nonstop. Um, you know, many areas in Savannah are, are also good for uh, planting crops and so on. So we do lose Savannah, but I'm not sure if it's been highly in, in the 20 odd years since that publication. I'm not sure how much has actually been lost. Yeah, yeah, I think it's ever it's it's changing, especially current with current events or so. I, I, I think so. But, you know, on the other hand, there have um, also been more, more um, in, in many cases, private landowners agreeing to formal conservation uh, efforts um, on their land. So it's difficult to say, oh, yeah. has there been a total uh, reduction or real big change? I, I, I can't answer that. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think let's take uh, Blaine. You have your hand up, so I think let's take your question, and then I'll go back to the comments. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Blaine. Uh, hi, Doctor. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, in my regards. I'm not sure about relevance, but um, regarding the mycelia levels um, that that are normally found out of the soil, um, would it would it would it differ uh, dramatically, sort of going from your 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 wetter or moist savannas to to the drier areas? Um, you, you know, it's, sometimes one's got to be honest and, and and answer the question by saying I really don't know. <laughs> I, I should think they are probably more uh, more prevalent in the moister um, areas. Even though there's, there's a lot of leaching, the soils tend generally to be moister, and I think the mycelial levels will probably be higher. Okay, I was okay. probably about the best I can give. It's not not my speciality that one. Yeah, that's no problem. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> uh, Daniel, you're there. Uh, it's good afternoon, Doctor. How does fire and herbivory affect moist and dry savannas? So I think it's a comparison. Yeah, look. Um, there's higher biomass in moist savanna, okay, because of the more rainfall, there's more vegetation, and grasses tend to dry out uh, quite quickly, um, and there's a greater biomass of grasses in the moist savanna, so therefore the chances of um, uh, the need for a fire and the chances of a fire happening are greater in the um, moist savannas because there's always a lot of dead grass available and um, that happens 
in, in a period of one to five years, a, a fire is needed. Whereas in the drier savannas, there's there's less dry grass, therefore fires occur far less frequently um, in, in frequencies greater than five year periods. So the, gro the grasses in, in, in arid savannas tend to uh, be palatable for longer. Um, and they don't dry out as quickly as those in the moist savanna, which is sounds a bit strange, but a reality. Thank you, Doctor. Um, there's I'm I'm sifting through all of this. There's so many compliments. So <laughs> I'm not finding the questions. <laughs> um, there's a comment that I think this is from Babalo that you might like. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I totally agree. It's actually about oh twenty thousand. 20 million 500,000 hectare saved for conservation by game rangers instead of other land uses such as agriculture and mining. So it's a big win for our industry. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, figure. I wondered exactly what it was, how much it was. <laughs> Great. Um, there's, I think you did cover this in your lecture, but then Bamaketz is asking examples of trees found in moist savannah. So uh, your bush willows, for example, are um, uh, found in, in, in moist savannas. Uh, Mapani is usually well-known Mapani. A little bit of a, uh, as you saw in my presentation, um, a mixture between the, the dry and the, the, the moist continuum. But Mapani often found in, in moist areas as well. And then um, trees like the big jackalberry, uh, also a moist, moist species. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, we're going to send all these compliments to you, <laughs> I think, via email, because it's, uh, the chat is filled with uh, just positive notes. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Dr. Bruce. And I think I'm going to actually just put a stop to the questions for now, um, if there is anything else. It will be in the email as well. Hi, uh, yes. Um, I think Blaine um, would like to say something, but also I would like to say from behalf of myself and my students as well, but um, Blaine is the allocated student. Um, Dr. McKenzie, thank you. As I said in the beginning of the talk, you're going to blow me away, and you did. Um, I'm a social ecologist, and <laughs> for many years, um, that is what I've been doing. But I started my career at Saker Bush Run Nature Reserve. Okay. And you should know it's a, grass, it's a grassland area and that's where my career took off. So today you just energized me again and I think it's time that I got back into ecology. So now I'm feeling sorry for the lecturers in my department. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, my other... Um, colleague is also online. Um, that is Ms. Tobili Dlamini. And as I said in the beginning, she's amazing. So if you can also, Aisha, please unmute her so she can also, as well as Blaine. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Um, it was a wonderful talk and I appreciate it. Uh, it actually covered what I expected, and um, the rest, we already have it in class, so we'll talk about it, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I loved it. It was very simple and easier to understand. I hope my students got it very well. <laughs> thank you. Hi, and then, uh, hi, doctor. Um, sorry, I just want to say a tremendous thank you from the first and second year nature conservation students at TUT. Uh, sorry, my camera isn't really working. So, um, but I'm pretty sure we can see from the from the comments um, that your 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 talk has sort of um, sort of hit us all very um, uh, sort of very effectively. Sorry for lack of better words. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you from from the entirety of TUT. We really appreciate the the splendid talk. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, you're welcome. And you're welcome to, I, I, I'm very happy to give another talk on a uh, bit more on energy, which is really yes. my, my favorite. 
I'm looking forward to that. Yes. So we've got yeah <laughs> two minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna. I think everyone's waiting for this. Um, the book prizes. So I'm going to ask you guys to, if you're willing to, to please show your faces. And that is uh, Asima, Pabalo, and Daniel. Thank you for the tremendous talk. It was very crucial for our cause. And we thank you very much, Doctor. Pleasure. Hope you enjoy the book. Yeah, definitely will do. <laughs> so I think if that's that, Dr. Bruce, it's been an honor, really. Thank you very much. And have a good day, everybody.